Vampire movies are a dime a dozen these days, but the awesome 30 Days of Night does a lot to push the genre forward by depicting the bloodthirsty creatures of the night in exciting ways. The premise of the film is intriguing. A town located at the northernmost point of Alaska is going through a solid month of no daylight, a phenomenon known as a polar night. During this time, the quiet, isolated town of Barrow finds itself ambushed by a band of creatures with superhuman abilities and razor-sharp teeth. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we're going to examine the Nosferatu of 30 Days of Night, exploring their lore, physiology, behavior, and abilities. To best understand the lore surrounding the vampires of this franchise, we need to also grab a few details from the comics, miniseries, and the film's sequel. The first 30 Days of Night film introduces us to a small tribe of these creatures, led by a single leader called Vicente Malo. He's often seen speaking a strange language which can only be assumed to be a vampiric tongue. Due to the immortal nature of the vampires, we can further take that the language is archaic, implying that Marlow is, in fact, a much older vampire, perhaps even ancient. Around the movie's closing act, the vampire leader can be seen talking about the existence of their species needing to remain hidden. This revelation reveals that their society had likely existed for millennia, perhaps even before the dawn of man. We also know that from the straight-to-DVD sequel that the Queen of the Vampires, Lilith, claims to be the mother of all vampires, and that she and her husband Vicente were part of the Elder Council that governed their species for a significantly long time. The Elder Council had made a first attempt at making their species known to humanity close to a millennium before the film's events. However, the humans, who significantly outnumbered them, rebelled and fought back until the Nosferatu's numbers dwindled, forcing them, once again, into hiding. This is confirmed by a statement Marlowe makes about needing to spend centuries making humans believe that their species was nothing but a bad dream. I make FYI, I'm piecing together information from both the comics and the films, but it's essential to bear in mind that there are some critical differences between the two. What's intriguing about the vampires in 30 Days of Night is the way humans are turned. In most vampire lore, there's usually a supernatural element behind turning a human into a creature of the night, and in some stupid cases, the vampires glitter. In this case, however, there's plenty of evidence to suggest it's a viral infection that causes the transformation. As a start, we've seen the vampires in the movie take several critical hits and survive them. From bullet wounds piercing vital organs to half their heads being blown off, these vamps can survive anything less than a complete beheading. At the same time, their wounds don't seem to regenerate, although they could just have a slower acting healing factor. This is in contrast to supernatural based vampires that tend to have faster, near instant healing capabilities, making them appear utterly impervious to bodily harm. We also know that the vampires of 30 Days of Night aren't affected by other classic bloodsucker repellents like crucifixes, garlic, or holy water. Since these home remedies are more in tune with combating beings of a supernatural nature, we can unequivocally conclude that these vamps are created biologically. While its origins are unknown, the Nosferatu virus responsible for their kind is transmitted through bites and scratches from a Nosferatu, with transformation speed greatly depending on viral load and the virus's point of entry. In the film, Eben is forced to inject himself in the arm with infected blood to confront the Nosferatu and retains his mental faculties for a good amount of time. Billy the Deputy, however, transforms almost immediately after being savagely bitten in the neck and seemingly loses control of itself. We can theorize that he must have been given a much higher viral load because of how long he was being chewed on. Coupling this with the close proximity of the bite to the brain, the reason why he became a full-blown Nosferatu so quickly starts making sense. Further adding credence to this theory is that Eben actually injected himself with Billy's blood, who was killed while he was turning, and not a Nosferatu, meaning he administered a lower viral load. 30 Days of Night makes a significant effort to distinguish its vampires from those we're more familiar with. At first glance, they appear to be one and the same, with all the typical vampiric trappings. They've got superhuman speed and strength, they're immortal, they have a taste for blood, and are only able to roam the earth after the sun goes down. But this is where most of the similarities end. At their core, the Nosferatu are pack hunters, and like every sensible wolf pack, they have a social structure and rules of conduct. The pack leaders are the alpha male and female, and these two vampires are dominant over all the other creatures in the tribe. It's likely that the alpha male and female are the first to feed, and are the only two allowed to convert humans to vampires. 
Like wolves, the Nosferatu in the pack can move up and down in the hierarchy, and a vampire lower down in the pecking order may challenge the alpha for leadership, which is what Eben ends up doing at the end. Another one of the most noticeable differences is in the teeth. Traditional vampires tend to have more elongated incisors, while the rest of their denticles resemble that of a human. However, in 30 Days of Night, the vamps all have their teeth turn into pointy, sharp fangs that look like the stuff of nightmares. This is because these vamps trade elegance for efficiency. As their attacks occur from various angles and in different parts of the body, they have as many sharp fangs as possible to feed and transmit their virus with efficacy. Their other natural weapons are their long nails. These outstretched, hardened claws grow out of where once were fingernails and are their preferred method of attack and even torture. The Nosferatu also have pale, near-white skin that's a far cry sicklier than those of traditional vampires. Whereas your typical supernatural creatures of the night look like they can blend into human society, these creatures stand out and look straight up undead. Finally, a dead giveaway of a vampire in 30 Days of Night is their dark, blackened eyes. After Ebert injects himself, we can see his eyes changing colour rapidly, indicating that he's no longer human. The contrast between the vampire's pale white skin and black eyes is strikingly terrifying. Coupling this with their thinner eye shapes, we can see a violent and sinister look develop as their animalistic nature takes form. I can smell your blood. What I love is that the Nosferatu have also demonstrated a few other abilities. While they don't seem to be able to transmogrify into other beings or shapeshift like their supernatural counterparts, they do seem to be able to teleport, at least across short distances, though this may in fact just be them moving too fast to be perceived. The vampires also have highly keen senses across the board, with their sense of smell likely being their strongest. Despite the Alaskan cold that can potentially reach well below 20 degrees Celsius, they're still able to track and follow their familiar to the town of Barrow. As we mentioned earlier, the vampires in 30 Days of Night don't have most of the weaknesses of their more traditional counterparts. Stabbing them in the heart with a stake won't work, garlic isn't going to do much to repel them, and headshots are only a minor inconvenience. The only two ways to destroy them is through complete decapitation or prolonged exposure to direct sunlight or UV lighting. We see a few instances of vampires being rendered entirely immobile and inanimate after having their heads chopped off, a result of the brain being taken out of the equation. We also witness Eben punch cleanly through Marlowe's cranium, obliterating his grey matter entirely, which terrified the Alpha's kin into running away. As I've mentioned, sunlight and UV lighting are also effective at defeating them. Well, sort of. Eben effectively mortally wounds the Nosferatu using UV lights, and in the closing moments of the film, he himself submits to being destroyed by sunlight and is turned into ashes, in what can only be described as an agonising death. But if we're going by the remaining lore, particularly the closing moments of the second film, death doesn't seem to be permanent. After digging up her husband's body, a now recast Stella uses her blood to bring back her recast husband, illustrating that death isn't permanent for the Nosferatu. It's therefore likely that even beheaded vampires could be put back together again with the use of human blood. The Nosferatu and the expansive 30 Days of Night franchise are some of the most terrifyingly aggressive and durable creatures of the night that we've seen in the genre. Well, that's all for today, folks. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the Nosferatu, so please sound off in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.